they'll never want to see a rake or plow. And who the deuce can call it ooh a cow? How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Terry? Hey, YouTube. First off, before we go anywhere, I, I want to apologize for, uh, at the beginning of my last video, I got angry at some children and, and chased them off of my lawn. And uh, while I realize that makes me kind of a, a stereotype, you know, angry old man yelling at kids, I can say that at the very least, I am not one of those crazy old men who sits in a room all alone and talks to people who aren't even there. Okay, uh, the you may have noticed that the theme song for the opening of this video is a little different than uh, uh, than normal. That's a song that is kind of emblematic of the social shift that occurred in, in the United States after the end of the First World War. It's a song that's called uh, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris. Now this is, this is, this is very indicative of the, the change that was made prior to the First World War and for many years afterwards most of this country was agricultural, rural, people living out in the country. Okay, now while we did have a huge uh, industrial base and we had a lot of people living in cities working in industry all over the country, uh, we still had folk, more folks living on farms or working on farms uh, in rural areas than we did in cities. And what happened was, uh, is all of these young country boys suddenly found themselves in Great Britain and France and doing the ooh-la-la -la and the voulez-vous coucher avec moi, if my French is okay. Now, that shift changed anybody who went overseas. It changed the way they looked at the world. Okay, suddenly it was bigger. Suddenly it was a lot bigger. And there was a lot more going on, and there was a lot more that they found out they could do. Now this affected every, every part of life in the United States, and even uh, how we hunted and camped. And that's what we're going to talk about here in this video is what kind of effect the First World War had on backpacking, motor camping. Okay, let's get on with it. Okay, now we talked a little bit uh, on the last video about uh, how, how much surplus, army surplus camping gear uh, that could be used as camping gear uh, flooded the market in the uh, late 1920s and early 1930s, in addition to all of the pre-World War I gear that was released prior to the end of the war. Now, it's my contention and my opinion that this retarded the growth of uh, the outdoor industry as it applies to backcountry camping, trekking, tramping, what we call today backpacking. The motor camping industry was going great guns servicing the family camping aspect of outdoor sports. And that still continues today. For, for every one backpacker out there, you've probably got five or six guys who only go camping once or twice a year with a huge tent and six kids. Or maybe three kids. Who cares how many kids? You get the idea. Now, uh, in the video we did on uh, coming to terms with backpacking, we mentioned a little bit how the Army's 
a new 1910 pack system load bearing equipment uh, in today's terminology uh, affected the design and the whole concept behind individual load bearing kind of give a, a review where as we showed in the last video most load bearing was done using horseshoe packs and haversacks and canteens hung separately what the 1910 system did was that it provided the idea it gave us the idea of putting the pack and you'll have to watch that first video to know what I'm talking about the pack and the haversack together in one unit that would fit linearly down the spine okay we're gonna leave that with you going back and reviewing those videos if you haven't before and then we're going to move on to a couple of other things. And the one, the biggest thing, I think, uh, World War I affected. Okay, now the first observation we can make is that after the end of the First World War, many states uh, sent out questionnaires to the veterans in their state asking them about their war service. Now, it's not a fantastic research tool because not all states did this. Not all veterans answered. And they didn't ask the same questions. However, we can get some impressions by looking at these. The overwhelming response to the question, uh, to the effect of, what did you enjoy most about your service? The overwhelming response was life in the outdoors. Now that's pretty amazing. Uh, the first thing is that a good many of these people, as we mentioned before, were, were farmers and ranchers or, or worked for farmers and ranchers. They already had a life outdoors, but it was a life of work. It was a life of toil. Now, even though marching 20, mi 20 miles with 80 pounds in your, on your back can be considered uh, a life of toil, uh, this is an experience these guys previously hadn't had. Going outside, walking long distances with a pack on your back and sleeping in a tent. And, and finding out that, you know, it is kind of fun. It is kind of neat. I get to smell the air. I get to hear the birds. I, I, need, I get to sit down with my buddies at night. Now, this was something new to all of these guys out in the hinterlands. But it was a total revelation to the guys who came from the cities, who worked in industry, who lived in three-story uh, three tenements. Suddenly, they, they, the entire world of being outside was opened up to them. And this caused, I believe, uh, a good many of them to seek the same kind of life after the war. That when they went out to look for enjoyment, and given their economic circumstance, Staying outside in the woods for a couple of days was a good thing to do, and it was fairly cheap. So once you consider that the population in the United States in 1918 was about 103 million people, adults and children, men and women, and that 4 million men overseas and tens of thousands of them here in the United States training in preparation for going overseas, we're finding out that living in the outdoors, walking a long way, carrying a pack, sleeping in a tent, didn't kill you, wasn't near as dangerous as their parents who, who had to travel across the United States in the 1870s and 80s facing Indians and bandits and disease and extremes of weather and all sorts of other tribulations. Staying outside was relatively safe, fairly enjoyable. Now that's 4%, roughly 4% of the population in the United States have suddenly made this, this new 
discovery. Okay? And it's my contention that this is primarily uh, what led to the explosion of the motor camping craze in uh, the 1920s. But there was something else going on in the military uh, at that time overseas that laid a bigger foundation for outdoor sports, particularly for the kind of backcountry camping we're talking about here uh, with, uh, with, with Bannerman's Camp and our version of classic camping living history. Let's dig into that for just a minute. Okay, so the Army's problem was this. Regulations dictated that anyone in the service who had served four months was due seven days of leave, seven paid days of vacation, if you will. Now, most of the time that isn't much of a problem because nobody joins the Army all at the same time, except in World War I, where the Army went from about 250,000 to 4 million. Okay, that means that somewhere around three and three-quarter million people all got in the Army at the same time, within a couple of months. And all of these guys were sent to, to Europe, sent to France as parts of large divisions, okay, 17 to 20,000 people at a time, okay, which means that if you calculate your leave time upon the date in which you arrive in France, that means that the whole shebang goes on leave at the same time. Now what do you do with those people? Okay, they can't all go to Paris. You can't let them loose on the countryside because it's more than one division at a time. What the Army did was is they established between 1917 and 1919 they established about 39 leave areas, rest and recreation areas, in what had been uh, luxury resorts in the French Alps. These resorts weren't seeing much business during a time of war when everybody in France was either in the army or married to somebody who was in the army, and they were all in the trenches. They weren't seeing much visitation. There were a lot of empty hotel rooms basically it. So the YMCA, which was running the Army's uh, show for entertainment and what we call the PX, contracted with all of these re resort towns uh, to host units coming in uh, for seven days or three or four or five day leaves to stay in the hotels and resorts in those towns. Now it turns out that when you got a resort in, in the Alps, in the mountains, uh, a lot of the entertainment centers around taking hikes in the mountains, climbing the mountains, doing a lot of outdoor activity that wasn't associated with marching. Well, now, now these guys, now up to two million men, went to these little resort villages, towns, uh, during during the war, okay, until 1919. Now, not only have they seen that they can march and carry a pack and sleep in a tent as part of a military unit, but now they're finding out that there are other things that can be done. You can hike to an alpine lake and do some fishing. Now, when the peace treaty that ended the First World War was signed in June of 1919, part of the provision of that was that the Germans would allow uh, the uh, Allied powers to occupy land in Germany just in case they acted bad again. The United States Army provided 250,000 troops to occupy uh, cities along the Rhine, uh, and the last of those left in 1923. The problem was, is that with the signing of that peace treaty, most of the National Guard troops 
We're scheduled to go home. That's the conditions of the deal. We're here until the war is over. The war is over. Now we're going home. Okay. But an army that started out at 250,000 inside the borders of the United States now has to provide 250,000 not only inside the borders of the United States, but another 250,000 sitting on a river in Germany. So they came out with a program whereby National Guard soldiers could volunteer for the American Regular Army to serve in the Army of Occupation until that bunch went home. And in return for doing this, the military would give you the choice of either one free year of college in a, uh, in a European university or one free year of travel throughout Europe once your service was over. Now what that meant was that a number of men, somewhere around 100,000 or so, uh, stayed in Germany, went to German resorts, and uh, went to school with European college students. Now Europe had had a long tradition of uh, hiking. In German there's a word for it called Wagen mit der Pack und Stick. Okay, I made that up. But to, 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 uh, to make the point here is, is that these guys are stuck around and, and now they, they, they've gotten this experience interacting with the locals and their traditions. And the ones who went and traveled through Europe, a good number of them undoubtedly joined in some of the religious uh, pilgrimages that, uh, like the uh, Camino Santiago. Many of you know about the Camino. There used to be a lot more pilgrimage hikes like that throughout Europe uh, than there is today. So a number of those troops would have done that. And now we not only have established the tradition of hiking in the woods, but now we're establishing you know, uh, Americans doing long distance hiking. And it's not shortly after this that we start looking at, we, we start seeing the establishment of long distance trails in the United States. Uh, the Long Trail in Vermont, the Appalachian Trail, the John Muir Trail, and numbers of others throughout the country. Now, uh, one additional thing uh, that, that occurred was these resorts were in alpine areas, so many American men were exposed to skiing, alpine skiing. Prior to this, this is not to say that there wasn't a tradition in this country already established about hiking and skiing, but again, these were pursuits that were mainly province of the affluent. Now what we've got is the common man. People of lower economic ability, uh, circumstance, being exposed to these things and finding out it's not really as expensive as they thought it was. Okay, so now we've got somewhere around two million men who are being or have been exposed to the European traditions of alpine skiing and mountaineering in alpine conditions. Now the difference between the United States and Europe under those two hobbies, those two sports activities, is that in Europe if you want to go skiing or if you want to climb a mountain and you live in Paris, you can get on the train, you can spend a few hours on the train, and it will dump you off at a train station at a town that is at the base of the mountain. You can stay in a hotel, you can eat breakfast, and then you can go up the mountain and you can shush or you can carry. 
And then when you're done, you go back to the train, you go home, you sleep on the train. Now in the United States, you could do that only on the eastern seaboard. You could do that in the White Mountains in the Green, uh, of New Hampshire and the Green Mountains of Vermont. But you couldn't end up at the base of a mountain in the Rockies. The best you could do was to take the train to a town that was close, within three or four days walk, or ride by horse, and travel from the train station to get to the base of the mountain to do your skiing or your mountaineering. Now this alpine tradition, this, this mountaineering and skiing in alpine areas uh, being basically born in the early 1920s comes to full fruition uh, in the 1940s with the uh, formation of the 10th Mountain Division. And we're going to be getting into that later on in the History of Gear series. Right now we're going to establish a base, uh, we're going to continue on with our 1920s and our 1930s. I'm going to focus more on the 30s from now on uh, in the History of Gear series. So stay tuned with that so that you can go that far with me. And again, if you have found this video entertaining and informative, or one of each, uh, please like the video. Uh, please subscribe. Both of those will help people who have a similar interest and are looking for this stuff to find it. Okay? Uh, also, if you can, please share these videos in, in, uh, with your friends and in other social media sites that I don't necessarily get to. But again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for subscribing. And if you have any questions, uh, please comment or join the Bannerman's Camp Facebook page where we have a lot of discussion about these subjects. Other than that, we'll see you down the trail.